My name is Monk Rowe, and we're at the IAJE conference in New York City. I'm pleased to have Dave Robinson with me today, cornet, trumpet player, and jazz educator. Mm -hmm. Is that about cover what you do in the music business? Well, that's, that's the main thing, yeah. yeah. Did you start out um, with the intention of doing one or the other, being a full-time performer or an educator? Well, I didn't start out with the intention of doing either one. Uh, I enjoyed playing cornet in high school and college, trumpet and cornet, and uh, took piano lessons for a while. And actually at some point when I was young, I thought I'd probably continue with piano and drop the horn, but somehow it worked out the other way around. Mm. I could never get the two hands coordinated. and So I stayed with the horn through college and then wasn't sure if I would continue, but I had by then a very strong interest in jazz. Uh, specifically traditional jazz and uh, so when I got out of college a guy helped me put a band together to play traditional jazz for almost literally peanuts in a local uh, <laughs> <laughs> local restaurant <laughs> yeah. it was it was beer and snacks and yeah. a couple of bucks but uh, I did that for six years and that was my apprenticeship that's, really? that's how I learned to improvise just by doing that every week and was there so music it, I wound up being a horn player, and then right. from then I, I went on to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a full-time player, I'm a, what they call a weekend warrior, yeah. I play evenings and weekends, right. but I do a lot of gigging and have done a little bit of touring and mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. been very glad that I've stayed with that. Is, is your brother Scott older or younger than He's you? He's younger, four yeah. years younger. Did you think he was crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Did I, should, I do? I, I? should, <laughs> I should I probably not think, think people who don't know who I'm talking about, but <laughs> I was fascinated by his his fascination with just the horns and the you yeah. know he he described carrying the bass saxophone home from school at first time or something and I I being a saxophone player I could sort of relate he was talking about how heavy it was and hurt his hands but he he was damn he was gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's a very determined guy. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. What was that like in your house? Did he spur your interest, or was it the other way around? Well, it was the other way around because I was older, so yeah. I I just sort of gravitated to jazz on my own. Um, our parents had a the usual collect, eclectic collection of records, mm -hmm. and I kind of gravitated to the the Count Basie and the, the ragtime piano and the... Uh, Turk Murphy and Eddie Condon and that kind of thing, um, along with the Spike Jones, which is <laughs> another oh. big, big interest of mine. Yeah. Um, so I got into that and um, started playing it in, in school and, you know, not much improvising, but just dabbling in it and collecting records. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, Scott got interested, I guess, through my interest, but uh, he, he soon took off and far surpassed anything I've ever done yeah. <laughs> as a musician. Uh -huh. He's he's an amazing guy. He started out as a on a woodwind, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, an alto sax. I'm sure he told you in his interview, yeah. but he started on an alto that our grandfather gave to him. That uh -huh. was his school horn that he still had up in the attic. Oh right. And he Gee. I have memories of Scott sitting out in the field next to our grandparents' house and tootling on the mouthpiece just to you know, get used to making the sound with the reed and everything. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, going from Basie, your interest in the Basie, to playing in the small group traditional jazz, did you hear a lot of traditional jazz before you tried to play it? Well, yeah. I mean, I heard the records that my parents had, and then I started collecting as a teenager myself. So. Yeah, I was listening a whole lot more in those days than playing. <laughs> it, it took me till really after college, as oh, I say, huh? before I okay. learned to improvise very well. So. Yeah. Did you have any friends who shared your your listening habits? No, not not my <laughs> age. I traded with some older guys, tapes in the mail and stuff. Oh, but. I see. Yeah, but yeah, that's <laughs> no, your classmates were, were not no, into well, Turk Murphy. Actually, we I did have a I led a little. Uh, a little traditional jazz group in high school, and and I formed one in college and joined another one in college. So there was, back then there was a little bit of interest, but mm -hmm. uh, but but you know that was really going against the grain. Okay. 
And then did you uh, go on to get a music education degree? No. So you're, you're sort of, your interest in education in both performance is uh, self-directed? Uh, well, yes. I'd, I'm, I got into education because, uh, believe it or not, a, uh, a gentleman in Washington, D.C., near, near where I live, uh, years ago wanted to start up a youth traditional jazz band. He was a former resident of New Orleans and a friend of a lot of the guys in the Preservation Hall band and so yeah. forth. And he loved the music. He was a businessman. And so he wanted to uh, sponsor a, a youth group in town. So through the local jazz club, they found me. I was starting to get into some educational things at that point. Uh, in the schools, I would go out and do clinics and that kind of thing. Um, but I wasn't directing a, a band until that opportunity came along. So, so I took that on, and I've been directing. It's called the Capital Focus Jazz Band. It's one of the one of the very few traditional jazz bands on the east side mm -hmm. of the <laughs> of the U.S. And I've been directing them for about 19 years, almost. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm curious as to how much music theory you feel is appropriate or necessary for kids to know to improvise in traditional jazz. Well, you, you certainly have to know the basics. You have to know your scales and chords, but um, I would say it relies I don't know, I'm going to get in trouble no matter what I say, but <laughs> I would say it relies less on, um, it's not so much modal playing, you know, there's a lot of modal scales that uh, right. that people here at this conference are, are teaching to young people that uh, are needed for the later styles of jazz. For these styles, it's, uh, it's really more melody based, I think, and um, the changes, the chord changes tend to be simpler, mm -hmm. uh, but I find that that's actually a a bigger challenge in a lot of cases for for young players uh, because it's it, it is a, a smaller box to work within and it's uh, you know when you when you when you have a sort of a, a droning flat 11 chord going on for a while you can get away with a lot of different things in fact you're for expected sure. really to step outside of that right. and 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 play dissonant things and so forth so um, it's in some ways easier to to get away with playing a solo in that kind of a setting than in a setting where you've got a set of change you know 32 bar structure set of changes and a bridge or or a multi-strain piece that changes key and so forth right. and you've got to stay within that and a wrong note sounds like a wrong note uh, you know it's, it's just agree. a whole different uh, a whole different bag so I've in my band I've had a lot of players come in highly recommended that boy they're, they're really hot players but some of them, you know, you, you ask them to play a, a simple 32-bar tune, like I Got Rhythm or something, and, and they're kind of uh, all over the place. <laughs> Do they have trouble um, remembering where they are in the song while they're trying to improvise? Sometimes. Yeah. I think it's more just following the chord structure yeah. and staying within that and, and, and connecting the chords in a way that makes sense, playing a, a melodic line that makes sense. and and. For the earlier styles, playing a line that that makes sense stylistically, you know, and is not uh, using phrasing that's really outside of that genre. Mm -hmm. but, but young people just, for the most part, have not been exposed to the earlier styles. So, if you're, a, um, I'll set up a little scenario here. You know, you you have some parents talking to you about this youth band. They're thinking of having their child become a part of it, but they don't know anything about what is this traditional jazz. Can you describe it to them without playing it? I mean, what do you say to people to describe what you think traditional jazz is? Well, I'd, I prefer the term traditional jazz to Dixieland, which is a, mm -hmm. a, a name that rings a bell with a lot of people, but sometimes it rings the wrong bell, which is why I like to use the What's term What's the wrong bell? bell? Oh, well, we could be all day discussing that, and it's very controversial. You know, some people think it's really uh, ridiculous and highfalutin to not 
want to use the term Dixieland, but uh, in my experience, it, it has some some negative baggage that I think we need to lose. So well, I just prefer the term traditional jazz. To some people, it has a racial connotation, images of the old South and this yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, to others, it evokes images of uh, striped vests and straw hats and a lot of a lot of shtick and you know all flash and no substance yeah. you know somebody out front with the and, and burlesquing the music and that burlesquing whole thing. the music yeah That's and a good and a lot of educators you know think think in fact my <laughs> my college jazz instructor who shall remain nameless uh, said to me in all seriousness he said Dixieland isn't jazz it's just Dixieland oh. so uh, traditional jazz to answer your question when I when I use that term and somebody doesn't know what I mean uh, I, I say the New Orleans based styles that usually does it for them you know okay if I I've even pushed this further if I guess what I'm after is there a, is there a musical description that a layman can handle you know if well what is what is my son gonna be what what is he gonna be doing what kind of thing is this he's gonna be playing He's, he's going to be learning the, the early traditions of the music. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to be learning how to improvise within a 32-bar you know, structure or a, a multi-strain tune structure that, uh, that is probably unlike what he's playing against if he's improvising now in his mm -hmm. uh, high school jazz lab band or whatever. Okay. Uh, I just tell them it's, uh, and, and that we approach it, I, I take the extreme view that jazz styles don't lose their relevance. Something, something about jazz, and I guess pop music too, we, we, tend, to, we tend to throw styles away, whole, whole genres away. We say, okay, that was then, this is now, so we don't want to deal with that anymore. We've got to, you know, mm -hmm. and certainly there has to be innovation for any art form to grow. We, we want that, we need that, but as we add layers, we shouldn't be tossing out any of the old uh -huh. layers. Yeah. And if we do that, we'd better be prepared to toss out all of today's music, you know, in, in 50 oh, years. Yeah. You know, That's for, true. <laughs> I mean. I can't, you know, I can't imagine people tossing out Coltrane. You know, Coltrane will never be tossed out for Pete's sake. Well, we, we say that and we hope not. Yeah. But you know, people would have said that about Armstrong in the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Armstrong is, I guess, kind of an exception because he, he had his centennial a few years back and there was a lot of attention devoted to him. And you, and you hear a lot of people give lip service to Louis Armstrong, but you know what? They're not really out there, to, um, educators I'm talking about, they're not really out there teaching what Armstrong did or encouraging their students to try playing within that idiom you know mm -hmm. I mean it's it's sort of fashionable to name Louis Armstrong as sort of the top guy ever in right. jazz and right. yet how many people you know uh, think it's valid to play that way anymore that you know so right. I think it's valid to play that way I think it's uh, I think there's there's good and bad music in all the genres that jazz has come up with all the styles mm -hmm. and even within traditional jazz we have styles a lot of people don't realize that we've got a, a New Orleans we've got a couple of different New Orleans styles we've got a San Francisco style we've got a Chicago style and extensions from that oh. uh, and uh, young people need to learn all this what is it, can you pinpoint what's the major difference between those traditional jazz styles is it in the rhythm section or is it in the horn ensemble playing it's uh, well both it's um so for instance we have um there, there's various terms and, and there's a lot of disagreement of course about these various styles mm -hmm. but uh my view um which which f sort of forms the basis of this traditional jazz curriculum kit that i've developed is that um I think most people in, in the traditional jazz community would agree that there's at least three sort of main branches of what we call traditional jazz or Dixieland. There's a New Orleans branch, a Chicago branch, and a San Francisco branch. Most people would agree, although even some musicians are really not 
hip to what those mm. ch what those differences are. But uh, basically, the the New Orleans sound that you've got, I think, two aspects of that, or, or really three, if you count the brass band sound as a style, and I do. I think that's one sound. You know, a, a whole bunch of horns, no piano, no banjo, separate snare and bass drum, tuba, um, just a, a big. Uh, big, loud, raucous, joyous, you know, kick up your heels and yeah. celebrate kind of sound. Uh, then we have uh, the early recordings that are in the classic New Orleans style, the Louis Armstrong Hot Fives, the Jelly Roll Morton Red Hot Peppers, King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band, etc. Uh, that's a very uh, rather structured kind of style, a very tightly kind of a tightly knit ensemble sound. Very <clears throat> rough texture, but uh, um, but organized. And then we have the later, what's uh, what I call the New Orleans Revival style, which came to prominence in the 40s with people like George Lewis and Bunk Johnson. And that's a more loose, uh, kind of a laid back sound, a little more rough and ragged, but very much from the heart. Mm -hmm. It's It's a it's almost like a folk music. It tells a story. It's played right from the heart, and it doesn't concern itself overly with uh, European conventions, the classical European tradition, as as far as pitch and intonation and so forth. It's all about, you know, how can I, how can I tell a story? And then you have the uh, Chicago style, which is uh, more smooth and and swingy kind of a feel, uh, more maybe. Um, Technically accomplished playing, um, you know, a little bit more cerebral, and then you have the uh, chick the um, sorry the San Francisco branch, which is a very it kind of harks back to the classic New Orleans style, but with a twist. It's very brassy, and it's very two beat. It's kind of a mm chick mm chick uh -huh. instead of a bump 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 bump. Very uh, very insistent kind of swaggering rhythm. Uh, just a very distinctive sound, banjo and tuba instead of string bass. I was just going to ask the the. It, it's always seemed to me that the. Whether you have a tuba or whether you have a string bass really, changes the music. Mm -hmm. Although there are tuba players who can walk fours very well on yeah. tuba, and you know so even some bands playing San Francisco style have. have use the string bass playing mostly on one and okay. three, so <laughs> it can be done either way. But yeah, that does generally change the, the character of the music. Okay. Yeah. So in your curriculum, um, first of all, what inspired you to take on this hefty project? It is hefty, and <laughs> what inspired me is that I just saw the, a, a gaping need, and nobody else was doing it. and. I felt this was um, something that I'm kind of maybe uniquely qualified to do because I'm a player, I'm an educator, um, I I have full time employment in a company, so I'm you know I'm sort of in the corporate world, so I have a little bit of savvy about fundraising and organization mm -hmm. and so forth, and um, I just I just felt like I really had a concept of what is needed out there, and. By golly, I just ought to go do it because it needs to be done. So, is this the first uh, IAJE you've been to? No, no. Okay. Well, I've been to I, a bunch of these. Okay, so was it partly that going to those other conventions and seeing what was presented and what was not presented? Well, it's not. It's not just from observations here at the IAJE convention. Okay. It's. Uh, I mean, just getting out there in the jazz world. But uh, yeah, I guess what IAJE's been concentrating on has a lot to do with it. They're, they're serving the needs of uh, primarily high school and college educators who, whose programs tend to be built around big bands, right. <clears throat> jazz lab bands. And the idea is, you know, you need to involve as many students as possible. And the drawback is that the improvisation opportunities are limited in that kind of a setting. Well, I'm glad you said that because I, I was wondering if that seems an obvious thing, but I was wondering if you'd thought about that, that sometimes educational settings are about numbers, you know. So how do you address that issue 
of a band director who, oh yeah, I want to have some jazz in my school, but if they have a big band where they can get have 20 kids in it, and as opposed to having a traditional group where they might have six or eight. Mm -hmm. Well, I address, I try to address that yeah. in the, the kit. Um, what you can do is field or form two bands mm -hmm. and have, or two bands where you can, you can involve, you can double up each chair. You can either form two separate bands and keep their oh. personnel constant, or if you need to do it in one class and involve more, more students, you know, double up the chairs and have them take turns. Yeah. So and then you sort of mix maybe and match have them the split personnel. up later, you know, if you yeah. have to rehearse them at the same right. time. I mean, it's always sometimes a time issue with people. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But then you could, you know, that'd be cool if you had two groups. You could have a battle of the bands and <laughs> right. put them on the wagon and tie the wagon together, you know. <laughs> Kids would exactly. love that. Are you kidding? Yeah. They just would, uh, <laughs> I think they'd eat that up. Oh. I, I and I just looked a little bit inside, but I saw some scores. You have scores for music that. Uh, let me see if I'm stating this correctly. Traditional jazz, for the most part, was when they when the fellows originally did it was improvised, on sort of on the spot. Or am I incorrect? Well, I, I mean, I, I suppose it. Uh yeah, it began largely in the brass bands as brass band players began to improvise. Mm -hmm. um, by the time it was recorded, it was a more structured thing. That's that classic New Orleans sound that I was talking about. But probably in the earliest days, it, you know, the days of Buddy Bolden and so forth, it was uh, uh, actually those bands played a lot of. Uh, Sort of arrangements, I yes, guess, but, they did. but to a large extent, they were probably memorized, and then they began to embellish them, you know, mm -hmm. and add syncopation and so forth. And so, have you taken, or has someone else taken, like some of the Hot Five or Hot Seven recordings and, and notated them into playable arrangements? That, that has been done. I haven't. Well, I've done a little bit of transcribing, okay, um, but not for this kit, but. Uh, we do ho we do hope to include in this kit a transcription of Jelly Roll Morton's Black Bottom Stomp, mm -hmm. um, and that's something the students can play that requires no improvisation because it's what you call repertory, where you try to recreate an exact recording that's been transcribed right off the record. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's a very uh, challenging number for that'll challenge the best young players. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see if they you know if they listen to the record if they. Try to emulate well, we're going to put the record on the CD that's in that great. kit, when, if, yeah. providing I can get the rights to do that. That's we want to do that. Uh -huh. yeah. Didn't the European musicians um, try to emulate those sounds that they were hearing on those records and come up sounding, doing some pretty strange things to try to sound like those seventy eights? Well, as far as uh, traditional jazz, there's actually another stylistic branch of the music that's uh, called. European trad, or sometimes British trad, although it wasn't confined to Britain, but they just as just as the San Francisco people, Turk Murphy and Lou Waters and people like that, did a, essentially their own twist on the classic New Orleans sound. Uh, the Europeans did their own twist on the New Orleans revival sound, that loose '40s kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But they they made it less loose. It was more more polished, a little more structured. Uh, the drummers instead of concentrating mostly on snare. There's a lot of sort of more Chicago style drum work, ride cymbal and so forth. Um, but it's but it's got the bass and the banjo, which is kind of the heart of this European twist. Mm -hmm. And um, it's called British Trad or European Trad. So, and there were some very good groups that came out of that model. The Chris Barber Band, the Dutch Swing College Band, mm -hmm. Kenny Ball. Lots of lots of very good groups. Does the word trad by itself have connotations that the word traditional does not? Well, uh, yes, it does. <laughs> uh, 
The word traditional, I, st I prefer traditional jazz, as I said, to, mm -hmm. to Dixieland. Yeah. But uh, one of the drawbacks of using the term traditional jazz is that that term occasionally gets applied, I, I would say more than occasionally, gets applied to even Coltrane's music. I've seen in print the term traditional jazz to as applied well, to you know hard bop as opposed to uh, fusion uh -huh. or or Latin jazz or free jazz. Well, so you know anything that's not those is traditional in a very broad sense of the word. And yet up to the point where that word started to be used that way, it was a term that was used to mean you know the the New Orleans based jazz styles. And you know, given all the alternatives, I, I think it's still the best term to use. Uh, the Europeans, I don't know if they came up with it, but their style they called trad. Okay. Uh, that's the, the term associated with the European twist. And, um, and now trad has kind of broadened to be a, another name to encompass the whole breadth of the New Orleans based styles. And I use it a lot myself. And, and it, it, because traditional has been used more broadly, um, I guess trad is still a term that, I mean, you'd never hear, you, you would never hear John Coltrane, at least not yet, hear John Coltrane's music described as trad jazz. <laughs> so I think, but a lot of people aren't familiar with the term trad and don't know what it means. So uh -huh. I don't know. I mean, yeah. everything has its, uh, its pluses and minuses terminology wise. There's, it's just, the, the road is, uh, full of bumps and <laughs> potholes. <laughs> Just got to sort of pick the yeah. the, the best. I, I think traditional jazz does it. I think we, we really should try to hang on to that term to mm -hmm. mean the New Orleans based styles. That's what it used to mean. I think that's and does classic mean something else again? Well, see, classic, a lot of people use the term classic jazz to mean yeah. this, but um, classic jazz is a term that's even more widely and probably more properly applied to any recording or artist that has achieved, you know, great prominence in the yeah. history of the not, music. Not so Coltrane, right. I think you, you certainly, you can argue whether you should call John Coltrane's music traditional, but you certainly would call it classic, I think. Okay. Then it becomes more of an adjective that you could apply to any field. Oh, yeah. A classic choreo you know, this choreography is classic now or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so you have a couple partners, although you're doing the Well, I'm, the I'm spearheading lifting. the development yeah. of this kit. Um, this, is, this is being done by an organization that I founded called the Traditional Jazz Educators Network, which is um, just, just exactly that. It's a network of all the teachers in the yeah. country uh, that, are, that are showing young people how to play this kind of music. Uh, we're doing this, I'm, I'm the main, I mean, I'm the guy who thought up this thing and, and mm -hmm. uh, have taken on the, the bulk of the development part of this, um, but with input from other members of the organization. And we're doing this in partnership with uh, the Smithsonian Institution and IAJE, and we're doing it on behalf of and in cooperation with the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. So part of the funding, this, this is being funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, as well as the National Park Foundation, which is uh, an organization that does fundraising for the Park Service. Mm. Um, let's see, and we have uh, funding from the Rainier Foundation and from a private individual, a very substantial That's donation great. from a private individual who wishes to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, the American Federation of Jazz Societies has uh, donated, the Statesman of Jazz, so we, I spent right. years getting nowhere looking for funding, and then all of a sudden, within the last year, wow. things have started to click, so we've been able to make great progress. We've uh, shot a lot of video master classes, and uh, that's where most of the money has to go. That's, as you know, that's very expensive. So. Yes. <laughs> Does, um, did Katrina put a crimp in anything you did, did it change? Or no, it hasn't. It, it actually, uh, I think there's more awareness now of mm -hmm. the, the cultural heritage of New Orleans and what a treasure it is and what we stand to lose. And uh, so I, I kind of think we're probably better positioned for funding to complete this. We want to send this out to high school and college music 
teachers across the country for free. We want to print these up by the thousands and drop them in their laps because that's really well, the only way this is going to be paid attention to. What about junior high? Have you thought about that? I'm sure you probably did. Well, yes. I've div I wanted this to really dig into the music and, and present, be like a textbook. Uh, I didn't want to do, you know, like a calculus textbook that just shows you how to add 2 plus 2 equals 4. So I, I wanted it to cover the whole thing and really get deep into it. So it's r the fact that it's structured that way means it's going to be applied mostly at the college and high school level. But I did include an entry level arrangement that I did for uh, mm -hmm. non-improvisers. So I think middle schools could handle pieces of this, I, and I hope they will. And, and in fact, I've had middle, some middle school directors asking me for this. So. Well, I, I mentioned it because my, my daughter teaches middle school music, mm -hmm. and I've seen what's going on in their district near Rochester, New York, and they've got kids in junior high that are playing jazz quite well, but in the big big band experience, but these kids are standing up and taking solos. Or I'm not sure if their solos are worked out beforehand, some of them maybe, but it's quite amazing to see. Yeah, oh, there's, there's just some amazing young players out there. Yeah. No doubt about it. I, I have the privilege of directing some of the best young players in the D.C. area in the mm -hmm. Capital Focus Jazz Band, and uh, yeah, they constantly amaze me. Yeah. Um, what's with the bass saxophone? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs one in their living room. <laughs> oh, that's just an interest of mine, a collecting yeah. interest. Um, I'm a big record collector and uh, have done some broadcasting. And one year, many years ago, I was searching for a topic and hit upon a. a fun, it would be fun to see how many bass sax, different bass saxophonists I can find in my collection. That's something unusual. Really? And I found a bunch of them. And, and really enjoyed doing the show and was starting to get into the sound of it. So, uh, so then I just started to, you know, just like any collection starts, you you know, you just you pick up one or two things, and then all before you know it, it's a disease. You can't stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm I'm collecting bass sax recordings, and I did a whole bunch of follow-on uh, broadcasts with that, and I've I've had fun, and that's really taken off. The interest in in the bass saxophone has really. Uh, taken off. I guess, you know, you can buy them on eBay, and and there's new ones still being made. Uh, they're pretty expensive. Oh, new horns. Yeah, they're still, oh, I mean, the major manufacturers, for the most part, aren't making them, but there are there are some being made by specialty manufacturers, and and uh, boy, it just seems like, uh, I mean, there's, there's whole mailing lists on the internet devoted to bass saxophone, so. It just popped into my head. Do you include... Um you know, Paul Simon did that song called "You Can Call Me Al." Right, that was Ronnie Cooper on his one was and only Cooper appearance on on bass yeah. sax. Yeah, it's so funny when I think. And then my daughter had this uh, video clip of when Steve Martin did the song uh, "King Tut." King Tut. Yes. See, I can't tell yeah. you anything. <laughs> you are nuts. <laughs> I've got it all. You I'm can get you. professional help for In this problem. Basement. You know. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Who played that on King Tut? Do you know who that was? I think uh, it might no, been. nobody played it. It was just a. It, it was Howard Johnson. It's Howard Johnson, and and it, that was his horn at the time. I think he's sold it since then, but oh. uh, I don't think he actually played it. Um, it was just a uh, like a, a prop. I, I the, yeah, I, I sort of remember him in costume swinging yes, around. I right. might I might be wrong about that. I'm right. I'm almost certain that on the recorded LP version, there's no bass sax. Okay, but. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just okay. I, bet I, I remember that he's know. there, but I, I'm not sure. Who was the guy that came out of the coffin playing tenor sax? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh I can't remember. Who I that think was. that was Lou Marini. That sounds like but it might I'm be not right. Positive, yeah, but yeah. At any rate, there's there's our trivia for the day. There you for go. Sure. <laughs> Cheapers. Yeah. Um, it, and you play, uh, mm -hmm. you play gigs, and I, you had mentioned you're playing. In Washington soon with uh, one of our Hamilton College alums. Oh Don, right, yeah, that's Don what you Andre. said. Yeah, yeah. Is that what band is that? Is that the? Uh, they're a group called the Federal Jazz Commission. Yeah. They've been playing at a little uh, tavern in D.C. for over twenty-five years, every Tuesday night. And 
I fill in for them once in a while, and I'll be filling in next Tuesday. <laughs> I see. When you go to that, those kind of gigs, they have a, they have a book. You mean physically on stage, or you're reading uh, charts? No, no. Oh, they, okay. The, I think they practice tunes and routines. You know, they they've got a lot of things after twenty something years. They've got a lot of things pretty well worked out. You know, right. but uh, but it's 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 all improvised. They're not reading scored arrangements by any means. Okay. You know? Well, in your c curriculum is is one of the goals for the students to be performing this music to be able to do it without the music eventually that's that's always the end goal i'm uh -huh. i'm not it and this is just a I, i've tried to dig deeply into the the structure of the music but you know teachers are only going to have so much time to devote to this there's 23 lessons in here and each one is 30 to 40 minutes and that's about the most i could possibly expect a teacher to you know, a dedicated teacher to devote to this. Um, so beyond that, I'd, I haven't, this kit won't by itself get them to that stage. Mm -hmm. You know, there oh, are, yeah. the written arrangements have a lot of slash marks and, and chord symbols where they need to improvise. But, uh, yeah, to memorize it is, is a step that they're going to have to take on their own, and that, that takes a lot of time. You know. Is it... Um Let's see, how do I phrase this? Some jazz educators, some music educators can improvise, but many, it's not part of their mm -hmm. training. Right. So could they actually learn along? Oh, yeah. Well, this, this? Is a, this, this is a kit for the educators. It's, yeah, teach the teachers. <laughs> That's teach, what this is. Although teachers, I've tried to design this in a way that the DVD and the CD, at least, are things that if the teacher doesn't want to try to teach this, at least maybe he or she will hand it off to some of their students, say, or something you might want to check out. Okay. Plus, I've also tried to structure this so that it can serve as a, an appreciation curriculum for non-musicians. Mm -hmm. That's by, great. Just by backing out the rehearsal components and the, uh, the DVD master classes. Mm -hmm. uh, just show them the, we, the DVD will have an opening segment that shows some of the hottest adult bands and youth bands playing this music. Mm -hmm. So if you combine that with uh, the CD and a few other elements from the lesson plans, you know, you've got a good just uh, appreciation curriculum yeah. for non-musicians too. What about uh, things like that? No, New York State has the has NISMA. Do you know about NISMA? I'm not sure. It's like the New York State Music Association. Mm. It's not just jazz, it's the whole mm -hmm. gamut. Mm -hmm. And they have these big conventions every year in Rochester, New York. I'm wondering if that kind of could be a place to present oh, something you bet. like this, you know, depending on how much time you have on your hands. And Yeah, you bet. I, I hope, to, uh, hope to tap into IAJE's lists for a, a lot of the distribution of this. But, we, yeah, we do want to get it out to... Those who are teaching band, a lot of schools don't have a band program, or, or don't, well, a lot of schools don't have a band program, but uh, many that do don't have a jazz program, although it's a whole lot more widespread than it once was. And for those who don't, this could be an entree into that. So. I agree, and for those that might not have enough students to have the traditional big mm -hmm. band. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's right. the way most people go, but some schools, I remember when I taught high school, I I had to write my own arrangements because I had an odd mix of people. I didn't have a full big band, so this might be good for those kind of rural schools, perhaps, that don't have the numbers. Right. Well, I hope so. Um, and there are a lot of jazz lab band directors who are not players and, and don't improvise and maybe come from a classical background, but, but they still, you know, wave their arms in front of the big jazz lab band. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so... Uh, for those who are who are not jazzers themselves, but are willing to teach it if they have the right tools, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I hope I'm hope we're giving them the right tools here. Yeah. To show their show their students that jazz isn't all about Charlie Parker and beyond, or 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 John Coltrane and beyond. I mean, that's yeah. where or David some, Sanborn and beyond. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you know, the line just keeps <laughs> moving forward, and we just we can't be throwing anything away. Uh -huh. uh, jazz didn't evolve it. 
diversified. You know, it's not like uh, traditional jazz is not an embryonic predecessor to something better. It's something that that came along and then others built on that and did something new and so forth. But it's not like every step has to be better than the previous one. We need all of it, and it's all relevant today. Mm. And we need we need young people to understand that. Is there some kind of racial thing with um, black musicians nowadays being not playing uh, traditional jazz? I, it seems like most of the bands I see are all white mm -hmm. that do it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I, I would say they're, yeah, I, I would say so. I, I think... Uh, Outside of New Orleans, this kind of music is uh, is really foreign to the culture. But I mean that that goes for white and black students, and and Hispanics and mm -hmm. Asian and what have you. Um, this this is just pretty much fallen off the radar screen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, um, as everybody knows, um, a, a great disproportionate share of the innovations in this music have come from. African American artists, and uh, I, I think uh, the the music of of the African American community is is now very far removed from from this kind of thing, uh, except in New Orleans, where uh, this kind of music is heard on the streets, even even post Katrina, uh, it's struggling, but it's still there. It's mm -hmm. it's going to come back, uh, but it's it's a kind of a normal part of life down there, but. Mm -hmm. But having said that, even down there, uh, young musicians, and, and I'm told from those who live there, uh, particularly young African-American musicians, are, are more interested in, in moving forward from that, taking, for instance, the whole neo-brass band movement, the, the Dirty Dozen, and all the bands that they've inspired. In fact, I, I would say probably most brass bands down there today are built more on the Dirty Dozen model than on the original sound. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is, uh, the Dirty Dozen took the brass band instrumentation and really completely changed the sound of it, used uh, contemporary phrasing. Uh, the Dirty Dozen, of course, plays, uh, I mean, you'll hear them playing hip-hop and funk and all kinds of stuff uh, that has very little relation to traditional brass band sound at all, except that it has a sousaphone in there somewhere. Right. <laughs> you know? uh, and that's all good, too. Uh, but I think most most young players, and, and I'm told most African-American players in that city, are kind of more drawn towards that. And there's very little, even there, very little participation by young people in, in this music. So New Orleans is particularly, New Orleans teachers, uh, the, the park in there has told me New Orleans teachers have expressed a big interest in this. So I, I, hope, I hope having these kinds of materials will help bring it back, not only in the city where it all started, but uh, across the country. Yeah. My wife and I were in New Orleans just before Katrina, actually, on a vacation. Mm -hmm. We heard the most amazing group of, I guess, teenagers on the corner mm -hmm. playing in a brass band. I was just... Was it sort of a funky style brass band or yeah, traditional brass band? I think it was more traditional, although the mm -hmm. next time we heard them, the next night, they were playing an arrangement of a Stand By Me, a Benny King song, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. But they were wailing. And you can well, it's all in. I mean, it's blocks. not really the song. It's it's, it's really the, in the how it's yeah. approached. You yeah. know what they're doing with it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we need we need the brass band sound to continue to evolve. We need everything to continue to evolve. Yeah. We just need to, as things evolve, we need to remain proud of what's come before and not feel like we're we're doing something bad by continuing to enjoy it and con to continuing to play it. I think young people need to be inspired to believe that they can be just as self-realized in an older style as in a newer one, mm. and that the older styles don't lose their relevance just because they first popped up, you know, many years ago. Right. We don't do that in, in classical music. You know, we don't throw out Bach and Beethoven to listen to Schoenberg, do we? I mean, <laughs> the people still, you know, they, you go to Carnegie Hall, you, you'll hear Schoenberg one night, and you'll hear Bach and Beethoven the yeah. next night. Uh, more Bach and Beethoven you yeah probably right yeah. so I mean why yeah. do we feel we have to do that in, in jazz and yeah. popular music well, it's a darn good question I appreciate your efforts thank you
No, I'm glad you came by today, and thanks for your time. Well, I'm flattered. Thanks very much. Okay.